Hello, thank you for joining us today. I'm Miss Genevieve Sector. We now have an exclusive interview with Mr. Robert Hunter. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Okay. My first question is, what is global warming exactly? Well, in a nutshell, it's something that a scientist discovered in the late 1800s, which is like a, in a greenhouse, the sunlight comes through, the radiation from the sun comes through, and it creates heat. But when it goes to bounce back out, it doesn't. There's a, coming in, it's called long radiation, and going out, it's called short radiation. Anyway, the, the point is that the heat builds up within the uh, greenhouse, right. and the atmosphere of the planet works like a greenhouse. So right now, we're like a greenhouse that's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. There's no place for the heat to go. In a nutshell, that, that's the problem. Okay, and what are the effects of this effect on our planet? Well, uh, they're just beginning to measure it. Um, uh, we do know that in the, in the past, uh, we've had periods where it was really hot and periods when it was really cold. Um, and they're still trying to figure out the exact dynamics of it. But, uh, I mean, we do know that uh, already the ice, Arctic ice cap has, has melted about 40%. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the Antarctic, and there's huge, you know, uh, uh, chunks of ice breaking off the size of whole states and provinces in eastern Canada. Um, that falls into the water. Um, be, uh, the water levels start to rise. So what we have now is something like a billion, or at least a billion, probably two billion people in the world who are living on places that are just a few inches or feet above the ocean level. So as the ocean level rises, these people are going to have to go somewhere. We already have an overcrowded planet, so that's going to make uh, things even worse than it is. At the same time, we, when you, well, we're going to have, and already the oceans are rising. Now, it seems like a really small rise so far, but compared to how fast it normally happens, like there have been changes in, in the sea level often in the past, but it's something that occurs over like hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of millions of years. And this is now starting to happen just since the Industrial Revolution, which was wow. near the end of the 1700s. In fact, there's a graph, a famous graph that the scientists uh, use now, uh, called the hockey stick graph. And it shows that uh, for the last thousand years, temperatures have been going along, and there was a little ice age around the 14th century, a little dip like that, then another little ice age, and a little dip like that, and then you hit about 1700s, late 1700s, the Industrial Revolution, and it begins to rise. And it's been rising now on a curve like that. And we're about here right now. That's called an exponential curve. Once it goes up like that, it can begin to go up like that. So they say that the, 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 even the conservative scientific reports say that at the end of this century, the temperature will have increased around the planet by at least 5 degrees Celsius or possibly 10. Now those are very conservative, I've talked to the scientists, and those are very conservative estimates. Right. The other reality is, if you've been reading the papers lately, more and more scientists come along and saying, oh gee, the ice is melting faster than we thought, temperature is rising faster than we thought. And, and some of the ways you measure it, getting back to that issue, is like how, how early in the year do animals, uh, have, you know, do birds lay their eggs? Uh, how early do the plants start blooming? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're finding it across the board in the, in the northern hemisphere. This is all happening much, much sooner. So for instance, our summers now are 12 days longer than they were just 20 years ago. Really? So 20 years from now, that means that's a whole month longer. That's just if things increase at the same pace, not if that exponential curve happens. But the way it's rising faster now probably means, I mean, what this simply means is that this beautiful winter we're going to briefly enjoy here right now mm. is, it, is, is, is on the endangered list. Uh, the other problem with the global, the big problem is that uh, the, the global warming process is happening faster at the poles than it is at the, um, at the equator. Mm. So that, for instance, while uh, global temperatures have risen around the world, they're rising at four or five times that rate in the northern uh, and southern extremes of the planet. Uh, the bad news there is, for instance, polar bears depend on ice so they can go across the ice to hunt the seals. Uh, within about 30 years, um, the ice will be gone. The polar bears won't be able to get the seals. The polar bears are facing extinction. They've already been put on the threatened list. Uh, they're not the only things facing extinction. Of course, the caribou, uh, the reindeer, um, all these animals that are adapted to the Arctic conditions. When the Arctic conditions disappear, they don't have time to adapt. I mean, in, normal, in the normal course of events, it might take, like I said, thousands if not millions of years to change, and then they have a chance to adapt, but they do not have a chance to do it, you know, within the equivalent of one generation. Well, wow. so how does this affect us specifically here in Canada? Well, you know, the irony is Canadians are, 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 are among the people who will be most affected, apart from people who, have, who live on small islands. Really? Yeah, people wow. in small islands are, are faced with the fact they're going to have to move their whole people out and find another place. But in Canada, uh, we've already, I've talked to the chief climatologists, the scientists at Environment uh, they say that the, as the temperature has been rising, the incidence of forest fires has been rising steadily. Mm. 
every year. We've just been lucky the last few years that uh, there wasn't a, an awful lot of lightning. Otherwise, you could have, at some point, we'll reach the point where it's like a tinderbox. And a, a few lightning storms come along, and, and we could have all of our, uh, Environment Canada predicts that the boreal forests of Canada will be burned to the rock by the year 2020. It's yeah. not very far, far no, from now. Now, once that's happened, uh, what happens to your logging industry? Forget it. Never mind the logging industry, what happens to all the animals that are dependent on those forests? Forget about them, too. Um, we've already got a situation where the, in Western Canada the uh, drought conditions are the worst since the, what they call the Dirty Thirties, which was the Dust Bowl. Now, and they're already as bad as that. Now the interesting thing is you don't read much about it in the newspapers because they don't seem to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yet I've been reading it and, and sure enough, drought conditions are so bad there, I, I forget how many billions they had to shell out to farmers just to keep them going this year. But they're going to have to keep on shelling that out because it's not getting cooler, it's getting hotter. So in other words, we're going to wind up with a desert in western Canada. We're going to wind up with the forests all burned down. Uh, the fisheries have already been massively affected because as the ocean waters warm, get warmer, the fish go somewhere else, the fish that are adapted for a certain temperature right now. So the salmon are disappearing, the cod are gone. They're not coming back. Um, so there's your fishery, forestry, agriculture all being hit. Uh, those are the very things that we depend on for our existence. That's how seriously uh, we're going to be hit. And if everybody thinks we're going to keep in, on importing vegetables from California, they're overlooking the fact that California is running out of water and they want to grow those vegetables. Well, That's sort of a few of the issues. Now, what is the Kyoto Protocol and why do you think we need it? Well, um, uh, Kyoto Protocol refers to this meeting that happened in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan. But it was a process that started uh, about 15 years before when scientists first started noticing that, ooh, the temperatures are rising. And it actually came down to them wondering, where's all the carbon going? They assumed that all the carbon dioxide, which should be at a certain level, was, there was more, it was dis disappearing in some way they didn't understand. The oceans were supposed to be absorbing it, yet the calculations were all off. So they started looking around trying to figure it out. So it's actually, we've actually known for darn near 15 years now that the, the temperatures were rising. Uh, but in the United States, you had things like the Ronald Reagan, the right-wing Republican administration, killed off all research into this subject because the oil companies didn't want to hear about it because, after all, oil causes burning oil and fossil fuels, coal as well, right. is what's causing global warming. So the, po the politicians uh, deliberately stalled all the uh, um, research they could. And we have the situation now in the United States where George W. Bush has pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. Mm -hmm. The Americans produce 25% of, the, of the, all the greenhouse gases in the world. So it's like being in a, in a room about this size. There's a big fat guy standing there with cigars smoking nonstop while the rest of us are trying to get off of it. Um, so the Kyoto Protocol is a, a thing where um, I think it's 98 countries have signed so far where we all agree, because a problem like this isn't something that just one country can solve. Sure. It has to be done collectively. So 98 countries have, have agreed. Now, the deal hasn't quite gone through because the way it was agreed to, and I was at Kyoto, and it was a really big struggle to get that deal. Um, but uh, the deal is that once 55% uh, percent of the countries have signed the deal, and also that, that it has to add up to 55% percent of the greenhouse gases, and that's a deal so that the little countries can't gang up on the big ones. Now, we're all, we've, we've got past the 55% uh, percent of the countries, but we're waiting for Russia to sign now. And once Russia agrees, then we'll have passed the 55% percent of the emissions as well, and then it will become international law. Um, and countries that don't obey that will, will face penalties, trade sanctions, etc., etc. Now, the United States thinks it's the biggest guy on the, in the, on the block, and it is. Mm -hmm. So they're going to ignore it. But at a certain, their own scientists are, I mean, they're scientists. And, and at the state and provincial levels, not provincial, at the state and civic levels, uh, there's a lot of uh, going on in the United States because they, they, the scientists recognize the truth. And just the fact that the, uh, the, the, the Republican Party, which has been given tens, of, if not twenties and thirties of billions of dollars by the oil industry and the coal industry to block any research and to, and to pull out of Kyoto. In other words, they've been bought off by the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, they're going to have to uh, come to their senses. Um, I'm afraid it'll be later. Um, and in the meantime, we're all going to suffer. Now, the fact that Canada has finally signed on is the first thing I've been proud about being a Canadian uh, mm -hmm. since I can remember. Wow. Now, what can individuals do to help meet the Kyoto Protocol? Well, this is the whole thing. I mean, a company can do this and governments can do that. Individuals can start. But first of all, like for instance, I've stopped taking my car into work. I just go to, the, I, I'm far enough away from a subway that I have to drive to get to the subway. Then I park the car and I, and I uh, go by subway. Okay, well, it turns out each Canadian uh, that produces, each one of us produces four tons of greenhouse gases every year. Wow. And that's through the heating in our houses, 
we have very leaky houses that are poorly designed because we've had so much energy all along we've never thought about it. Right. But now, so that, that, that's a wastage of energy. So we make our houses more energy efficient by sealing windows and doors and stuff. It sounds really dull, but it makes a huge difference in the amount of fuel you have to use. Uh, we have to start converting our cars from fossil fuels to things like fuel cells. You can already use ethanol, which is a mixture of veg various vegetable kind of matter that produces uh, fuel that you can use in your cars, but doesn't produce greenhouse gases. So converting from fossil fuels to alternative fuels is important. You have to get away from, uh, above all, you have to get away from burning coal, coal-fired plants. That's where we get still most of our energy here in Ontario, and all of that stuff is just pure carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Going. So you need wind turbines. In places in Europe, it's almost, in some countries, it's almost 30% of their energy they're getting from wind now. And it's a, re, uh, it's a resource that's there forever. Right. And it doesn't create any pollution whatsoever. And then you have to switch to um, solar panels, for instance, uh, pho photovoltaic stuff. Uh, we have all the technology for doing all this. It's, it's just that right now it's still cheaper to burn coal. It's still cheaper uh, to use gasoline. And that's because the government subsidizes the coal industry and the oil industry and doesn't subsidize the wind industry or the solar panel industry. So, but these are the kind of changes we have to make as individuals. And so, you know, if you, and, and of course, things like the people who buy uh, sports utility vehicles, which blow off ten times, well, ten times, but about four times as much fuel as a regular car, these people are ecological criminals because their children and grandchildren are going to be living in a world where the forests are gone, the deserts have replaced the prairies, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll be looking back and say, gee, grandma and grandpa, you really didn't do anything for me, did you, except ruin my planet? Right, yes. Yeah, so it's very important for us to take steps now for the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, good luck, all of us. Thank you. <laughs>